If someone were to ask you what religion you are, you might naturally want to say Baptist. But that's not the right answer. Okay, our church is the Baptist church. But our religion is not the Baptist religion. Our religion is the religion of grace. Our dependence and how we go to heaven is by grace. We put our dependence in the grace of Jesus Christ. So religion is a Greek word. It means to tie together. So if, for example, you have two shoelaces. How are you going to tie them together? You need to religion them. You need to tie them together. The idea is, is that there is a God that is angry and then there is man that feels ashamed because of the sin that we have committed against angry God. And we need religion to bring the two back together again into fellowship. So how do we do that? It's either by works or by grace, which is the opposite of works. So our religion is not Baptist, it's not Christian, it's not Jesus. Our religion is grace. The grace of Jesus Christ is our religion. What is our church? Our church is the Baptist church. What is our denomination? We don't have a denomination. We don't give our money to a mother church somewhere, or a board of directors, or some living head guy somewhere in some office. We don't have that. We're not a denomination. We're a church. Our religion is by grace. So our church cannot take us into heaven, but our religion is what takes us to heaven. And our religion is dependent on the grace of Jesus Christ. So our religion is grace. Our church is a Baptist. To become part of the religion that takes you to heaven, that's the religion of grace, you need to be saved. When you become saved, you become a Christian, part of the religion of grace, but you're not a baptized, you're not a Baptist until you're a baptized. Okay, so when you get baptized, you join the Baptist church. Which one saves you? Baptism or grace? So which one will save you? Your religion or your church? Your religion. If your religion is the correct religion, which is dependence on the grace of Jesus Christ. Okay? So let's look at ten verses that teach that salvation is not by works. Okay? So let's look at the first one. Um, Romans. You, might, you can write this down if you want. If you want to turn there, that's fine. If you don't and you're busy writing it down, I understand. Uh, the first one is Romans chapter 3, verse 27. Romans chapter 3, verse 27. It says, Where is boasting then? It is excluded. By what law? Of works? Nay, but by the law of faith. So here, the question is, can we be saved by works? And what is the answer? Nay. The answer is nay. No. No can do, no. For we, know, for we all know Romans 3.23, For all have sinned and come short of the glory of God. Then Romans 3.24 says, But being, uh, being justified freely, for free, freely, by His grace, through the redemption that is in Christ Jesus. So what religion is it? Grace. So what about works? That's where our first verse is. Verse 27. Who, and that is... Uh, Skip down to verse 27. Where is boasting then? Um, it is excluded by what law of works name, but by the law of faith. And then the next verse says, in fact, let's do, for that first one, write down Romans 3, 27 through 28. Okay, let's go ahead and tack on verse 28. Therefore we conclude that a man is justified by faith without the deeds of the law. Deeds is your works. Without the works or without the deeds of the law. So verse 27 says, By what law? Of works? Nay. Verse 28 says, Without the deeds of the law. Or not by works. Okay? So the first verse is Romans chapter 3, verses 27 and 28. The next one is Romans chapter 4, verse 2. It's talking about how was Abraham saved. So in the Old Testament, is their salvation any different than ours today? The answer is no. And Paul here is making it 
very clear that Abraham was saved the same way that you and I are saved. By grace, not by works. Verse 2 of Romans chapter 4, it says, uh, For if Abraham were justified by works, he hath whereof to glory, but not before God. For what saith the scripture? Abraham believed God, and it was counted unto him for righteousness. So it's not that Abraham says Abraham was saved because of what he believed, not by his works. It says, if, if Abraham were justified by works, he had to wear up to glory, but not before God. If you're saved by works, you can receive glory for that. But God will not recognize that or give you glory. So, for example, if Joel does a good work, he gets an attaboy from his boss, right, from his friends or his co-workers, but that reward is not going to get him into heaven. And the works reward, the reward for our works, is not going to be given glory to God. So in here it says, Abraham, if he were justified by works, he gets glory, but not before God. For what saith the scripture, Abraham believed God, and it was counted unto him for righteousness. Verse number 4, now to him that worketh is a reward not reckoned of grace, but of debt. So, I don't want to get into too many verses here, but why don't we put Romans chapter 4, verses 2 through 5, for that second one. Romans chapter 4, verses 2 through 5. Okay? Because 5 says, But to him that worketh not, but believeth on him that justifieth the ungodly, his faith is counted for righteousness. So it's not his works that counts for righteousness. It's his faith. And it says, But to him that worketh not. So it's not the one that worketh. It's the one that worketh not. Okay? So that kind of, in verse 2, and verse 3, and verse 4, and verse 5, all four of those verses teach salvation is not by works, but it is by belief and faith in Jesus Christ. Okay? So we'll call that verse number two, even though I know it's four verses. I couldn't, I just couldn't cut it out. I couldn't do it. Okay? Now let's go to um, Romans chapter 11, verse 6. Some people will say, well, what about... <coughs> What about getting, doing works to receive grace? But well, we already read in Romans 3.27 that grace is given freely. Or it's free. And then also some people might say, well, what about mixing works with grace? So there's two religions. One is Grace. That's not hard, guys. Try that again. The first religion is grace. And the other religion is works. They're opposite. Every single person, every man, every woman, every child, depends in one of those two religions. People say there's so many religions in this world. How do I know which one is correct? How do I know the right one? No, there's not many religions in this world. There's two. Pretty simple. Just two works or grace. It's grace or it's works. That's two religions, no more, no less. Everyone, even atheists that don't believe in God, they still have the religion. That is the religion of works. So everyone has a religion, whether they even understand that or not. So it says here in, uh, so in Romans chapter 11, Verse number 6, it says, And if by grace, then is it no more of works. So if you're saved by grace, can you add it to works? Add our works with it? No, it says, if it's by grace, then it's no more of works. So if you take your religion, and you transfer your religion from works to grace, is it works anymore or no? No more. Right? No more. It says, otherwise, grace is no more grace. 
So if you transfer your religion, if you got saved, and I got saved when I was nine years old, I transferred my religion from my works to the grace of Jesus Christ. And if I were to tell you today that I'm still depending in grace plus works, the Bible says, if you say it's grace, and you want to include works, then grace is no more grace. That means that's not grace. If you try to mix works with grace together, it's not grace anymore. You don't have grace. It's one or the other. Let me read that again. And if by grace, so are we saved by grace? Yes. Yes, we are. And if by grace, which it is, then is it no more of works? Otherwise, grace is no more grace. But if it be of works, which is not, then is it no more grace? So if you're saying, oh, I'm saved by works plus grace, or if you say works plus grace, that's not works because you're putting grace to it. If you're saying, I'm saved by grace plus a little bit of works, that's not grace. Because you're adding works to it. No matter which side you take, you cannot mix grace and works. It's either grace or it's works. If you mix it, then grace is not grace. And works is not works. It's one or the other, grace or works. Okay? So that's Romans chapter 11, verse 6. Verse number 4. Verse number 4. Uh, Galatians chapter 2 verse 16 Galatians chapter 2 verse 16 it says knowing that a man is not justified by the works of the law let me repeat that knowing that a man is not justified that means saved kalitasan Knowing that a man is not justified by the works of the law, but by the faith of Jesus Christ. Even we have believed in Jesus Christ, that we might be justified by the faith of Christ, and not by the works of the law. For by the works of the law shall no flesh be justified. Three times, one verse, it says, not by works, not by works. No flesh justified by works. So three times in one verse, it tells us we are not saved by works. It's by our belief in the grace of Jesus Christ. Our faith in the grace of Jesus Christ. Our dependence in the grace of Jesus Christ, not of works. That was verse number four, right? Okay, good. Next verse. Uh, Ephesians chapter two, verses eight and nine. You already know these verses. For by grace, no religion that is, that's our religion, for by grace are you saved through faith? Faith in what? Faith in what? Faith in the grace of Jesus Christ. For by grace are you saved through faith. And that, what's the that? That's the grace of Jesus Christ. And that not of yourselves. It is the gift of God. So remember we talked about how grace is freely Given Acts 3 27. Now we come to Ephesians 2 8. It says it's a gift. It's free. It's a gift. Can you pay for a gift? Can you work for a gift? No. A grace is given. Gift is freely given. Grace is freely given. Grace is a gift. And then we come down to verse number 9. Not of works, lest any man should boast. Are we saved by works? Or are we saved by grace? Ephesians 2 8, for by grace are you saved. Ephesians 2 9, not of works. Okay? So that's verse number 5. Okay? 
Am I correct? That was verse number five, right? Okay. Verse number six. Verse number six. I'm trying to narrow it down to ten here. How about let's do Titus 3 5. Titus chapter 3, verse 5. It says, Not by works of righteousness which we have done. We repeat that. Not by works of righteousness which we have done. One more time. Not by works of righteousness which we have done. Are we saved by our works? No, not by works of righteousness which we have done. For according to His mercy, He saved us. Was it God's mercy, our dependence in the mercy and grace of God? Or is it works that saves us? It's dependence in God's grace and mercy. Not by works of righteousness which we have done, but according to His mercy, He saved us by the washing of regeneration and renewing of the Holy Ghost. Okay. Um, let's do Titus chapter 3, verse 7. Titus 3, 7. Titus 3, 7 says, That being justified by His grace, we should be made heirs according to the hope of the eternal life. Who wants to die and not have eternal life? Who hates eternal life? Raise your hand. Jabez, you just put your, your half eternal half, right? Okay. We all want eternal life. And here it says that we're justified by His grace. Remember, Romans 11, 6, 8, 9, Titus 3, 5 says that grace and works is opposite. It's as opposite as light and day. It's as opposite as McDonald's and Jollibee. There's nothing similar about those two. Nothing. Take it from a man who said one too many hamburgers and knows better, okay? Jollibee and McDonald's are opposite. Grace and works, light and dark, hot and cold are opposite. Spaghetti and Ponzi. It's opposite. One tastes like air. The other one is good. <laughs> so we see that it's by grace that we are justified. We get the hope of eternal life. Grace is the opposite of works. Let's look at... What was that? What number was that? What's that? That was number six? Okay. That was number six. Exodus chapter 20, you can just write down the whole chapter. Exodus 20 or 10 commandments. Okay? And this one I'm going to explain. It's uh, the 10 commandments. I want someone to tell me one of the 10 commandments. Thou shalt not kill. Right? The Bible says, Whosoever hateth his brother without cause is guilty of murder. Okay, killing. Let me just go ahead and find that verse real quick. 1 John 3.15 hey, You don't have to write that down. I'm just showing you one of the Ten Commandments. 1 John 3.15 It says, Whosoever hateth his brother is a murderer, and ye know that no murderer hath eternal life abiding in him. So if you say, Okay, I'm saved by good works. I need to keep the Ten Commandments. Okay, what's one of the Ten Commandments? Thou shalt not kill. You ever kill someone? No. Well, according to beloved Apostle John in 1 John 3.15, it says, yes, you have. It says, whosoever hateth his brother is a murderer. Have you ever hated your brother, Elijah? Yeah, both of you. Have you ever hated your brother? First one, right there, you win. You're a murderer. This Elijah, you ever hated your brother before? Yes, he has. You're also a murderer. What do you guys win? Murder. 
Eternal life in hell. Okay, good job. Congratulations. Our winner, Jackpot. Whoever hates their brother is a murderer. So if you don't have a brother, then I guess it's okay to hate your sister. Okay? Give me another one of the Ten Commandments. Adultery. Thou shalt not commit adultery. Jesus said, Whosoever looketh upon a woman to lust after her hath committed adultery with her already in his heart. So you can ask any man or any woman, have you ever looked upon a woman or a man to lust after them? And they will all say yes. And you will say that according to Jesus, you have committed adultery. So you, we are all adulterers. So you can say, well, no, I've been faithful to my spouse. I've never committed adultery. Even to look upon a man or a woman to lust after them is adultery. So we're all killers. We're all adulterers. Can someone give me another one of the Ten Commandments? Steal. As, and you can ask them, if, was there ever a time in your life that you stole even just one time? Some people say, no, I haven't. Well, they're lying, but you can say, okay, were you ever late for someone? Because you've stolen that person's time. Is that your name, man, Joel, or no? You stole two minutes of all your time. Two, four, six, eight, ten, twelve, four. You owe about four hours here, buddy. Four hours, okay? We're going to collect. Right? So, if you're late for someone, you have stolen their time. We have all at some time stolen. What does that make us? Thieves. We're murderers. We're adulterers. We're thieves. What else? What? Okay, remember the Sabbath day. Keep it holy. Separate the seventh day. It's actually a ceremonial like what we talked about. But we can use that. Have you, in your life, always set apart a day for God? Really, one day every week, every week, your whole life, 51 weeks a year, you've always set one day out of every week apart for God? I don't think so. I don't think so. But, again, that's a ceremonial commandment. They know where to talk about seventh day. But that doesn't mean we should not put a day apart for God. We do have the first day of the week. The Bible says it's the Lord's day. Have you, including me, have we always put the Lord's day and given that day over to the Lord? Or have there been, day, have there been Lord's days in our life where we made that day about us and not about the Lord? I think so. And so, so we violated that as well. We've not kept the Lord's day. And we're murderers and adulterers and thieves. What's another one of the Ten Commandments? What? Yes, thou shalt have no other gods before me. And a god can be anything. It can be not just a graven image, but it can be a car. Or it can be a, a relationship. It can be, it can be anything. Money. That can be anything that you put before God is an idol. Have you always, all the time, every day, every decision, put God first? Or have there been times where you put something or someone else before God? Yeah, we have. So we have not always put made God first. What about a possession, an item like a car? Or a cell phone. We put that before God. That's idolatry. That makes us idolaters. Idolaters, murderers, thieves, adulterers. Thou shalt not lie. Liars. Right? Thou shalt not covet. Coveting is desiring something that does not belong to you and that it is not for sale. Have you ever wanted something that's not for sale? That's company. We're all very, very guilty of that. We're covetous. Do you ever take God's name in vain? Some people say, well, no, I've never said, oh my God. That's taking his name in vain. I'm not using it in vain because I'm teaching. But some people say, oh my gosh. Same name, folks. It's a euphemism for God. You say, oh my gosh. You millions will say, oh my God. It's the same. Or you say, geez. 
Maybe you use Jesus as a euphemism for Jesus. Don't say Jesus. Don't say gosh. Don't say Dane. Don't say those words. It's a euphemism for the name of God. You're cheapening, you're lessening the name of God. And that's a name that is holy. God revealed his name to us, and we need to keep that name holy. It's so revered by ancient Israelites, we don't even know the true pronunciation of that name. Because we don't have the vowels. They never wrote vowels down in their alphabet. So we don't even know the true name of Jehovah, the true pronunciation. Why? Because they revered it so much. So you might say, I've never said, oh my gosh, or oh my God, or Jesus, or Jesus, or gosh, gosh day. I've never done that. But have you ever used the name of God, maybe in a song or a conversation, that you use the name God and you did not think about and fully appreciate the name for who God is? Of course we have. We've just sang the hymn and not really thinking, thinking about something else, thinking about lunch, thinking about, you know, someone else, somewhere else, a problem at work. And we use the name of God and we're thinking about a problem at work. Guess what we've done? We blaspheme. Do you think that God looks lightly upon blasphemy? I don't think so. It makes us blasphemers. Liars, adulterers, thieves, murderers, idolaters, covetous. These, our works by the Ten Commandments proves that we cannot be saved by works. Okay? Um, what number are we at now? That was number what? What's that? What? Seven, okay. James 2.10, please. James 2.10, it says, you can go ahead and write this down. For whosoever shall keep the whole law and yet offend in one point, he is guilty of all. That means, Michael, let's say that you keep every law. You never sin that one time your whole life, except you tell one lie. That's it. You never murdered. You never stole, you never committed adultery, you never took God's name in vain, you kept the whole law. But one time, just once, you told one lie. Michael, according to this, it says, For whosoever shall keep the whole law, Michael says, I kept it all. Yet offended one point, Michael says, Yeah, but there was that one time I did lie. Just that once. Never stole, never cheated. I just one time I told one lie once then Michael becomes guilty of all. That means Michael becomes guilty of murder, blasphemy, you name it. Every sin in this entire rule book, he is now violated, he is now broken. So if we are saved by works, and we say our works are not that bad, I've never killed anyone, I've never stolen from anyone, i never broken the law to go to jail for anything. I'm a good person. The Bible says, guess what? You just do one sin. Just one lie. Steal one time. Say one bad word. Covet even one time. You're guilty of breaking every single law in the entire Bible. So even if they even if you say, okay, fine, you never, you never ever stole, you never ever used God's name in vain, you never ever coveted. Which is not true because we all have. We're still guilty of it just by breaking any commandment in the entire Bible. Okay? How can we be saved by works with James 2.10? I remember uh, having a Bible study and this girl, she just could not get to herself to believe that she was that bad until it opened up James 2.10. Now I understand. I am really guilty. She got saved. And it was this verse that was the key to her salvation. So what number was that? Eight. Okay, Acts chapter 16, please. Acts 16. We are running out of time. Acts chapter 16. 
This is the story of Paul and Silas when they were in prison and they began singing at midnight. And um, how about your, for your notes, why don't you write down Acts chapter 16, verse, how about verse 26 through 31. But especially 30 and 31. Okay? So I won't read the whole thing, but the, the, the prison guard, the, prison, the warden of the prison, the, the jailer, he was asleep and there was an earthquake. He looked in the prison and the doors were open. He thought the prisoners had escaped. So he decided to save the life of his family. He was going to do what Rome would have done to him anyway and kill himself with the sword. He was about to kill himself. Paul said, don't do it. We are all here. And the jailer said, sirs, in verse number 30, what must I do to be saved? What do you think Paul said? He said, you've got to get baptized, you need to repent, you need to say sorry, you need to go to church, you got to read the Bible, you got to love your neighbor, you got to be kind, you got to love your family, you got to be good at work, you got to be faithful to your spouse. You need to be studious to your boss. You need to make sure that you live a clean life. You need to follow the laws. Don't break the commandments. Keep the Ten Commandments. Is that what Paul said? No. He just said, all you need to do is get baptized. Isn't that what he said? No. He said, all you need to do is keep a few of the Ten Commandments. Isn't that what he said? No, he didn't say baptism. He didn't say anything about church or Bible reading. What did he say to answer his question? What must I do to be saved? And they said, Believe in the Lord Jesus Christ, and thou shalt be saved in thy house. That's it. He did not give him, Well, you've got to do the five things. Well, you can't get the... you got to keep the Sabbath day. Seventh day Adventist, they believe that the mark of the beast is the seventh or is Sunday worship. That's the mark of the beast. You guys are a bunch of Satan worshippers here from being here on Sunday morning, evil, wicked pigs. He didn't say anything about keeping the Sabbath day. He didn't say anything about the five things. He didn't say anything about baptism. He didn't say anything about works or the Ten Commandments. All he said was believe. He said, believe what? The grace of the Lord Jesus Christ. Religion of grace. Grace of the Lord Jesus Christ. That's it. What number was that? Number nine. Number ten. I just want you to write thief on the cross. Thief on the cross. So, and you can just tell the story because it's so familiar. This is a Catholic country. Um, just tell them about the thief on the cross. Remember how Jesus died on the cross? Remember how many crosses were there? Three, right? And remember how one guy on one side of Jesus was mocking him and said, if you're the son of God, then get us out of here. And the other guy on the other side says, you stop mocking him because I believe that he is the son of God. And that, thief, that man looked upon Jesus and said, Lord, remember me. When thou enterest into thy kingdom. And Jesus looked on that man. Did that man get baptized? Did he get down off the cross, get baptized, go back on the cross, and then die with Jesus a few hours later? No. Jesus says, Today thou shalt be with me in paradise. Just a few hours later, that man was going to be with Jesus in paradise. Did that man do good works or bad works? Bad works. He wasn't being crucified next to Jesus because of his good works. And that man said to the other man that was mocking Jesus, he said, we are here because we deserve to be here. So he admitted his works were bad, very bad works, works that even according to the laws of man deserved death. And he said to that other man, I deserve here. His works were bad. And he went to paradise, and later today, now he is in heaven. Because he got down from that cross, they baptized him, and then they nailed him back to the cross, and then heaven. Right? No, he did not get baptized. 
But what he did was for the next couple of hours that he was still alive, he did a lot of good works. He's up there on the cross and, uh, quick, come here, put some bottle of water in my mouth. Well, bring a kid over here. They bring a kid over your mouth. I'm going to squeeze this bottle of water in your mouth. <laughs> and then he gave water to the little kid. No, he did not do any good works. His hands and his legs were nailed to a cross right next to Jesus. He never had the chance to get baptized or do good works. It's not, he wasn't saved by works. What saved him is they looked upon Jesus and they said, Lord, save me. Remember me in thy kingdom. He believed that he was the Son of God. That's salvation. This is a bonus. But remember the Pharisee. He prayed a long prayer. I said, Lord, I thank thee that I am not as this publican next to me, tax collector, a dirty, corrupt Kagawa. I thank thee, Lord, that I am not as this man. But it says that that publican beat upon his breast and would not so much as lift his eyes to heaven. So contrite, so repentant. He wouldn't even look up and he says, Lord, save me a sinner. Which one went home justified? The man who did the good works? The one that prayed? Long prayers? The one that fasted often? Sometimes even three days a week? Was it that man, the Pharisee, that read his Bible and memorized the Pentateuch? Was it that man who did the good works? Or the publican that did the bad works? Which one went home justified? It was the publican that did the bad works. And tried to keep it to ten, they had to do a bonus. Okay? So those are just ten... Ten simple verses that teach we are not saved by works, we're saved by the religion of grace of Jesus Christ. Okay? So as we go out this afternoon, if you can if you have time to do that, take some of those ideas and some of those verses with you. You've already got them written down, hopefully. And if you can, just say, hey, I got a question for you. What are you depending on to get into heaven? If you were to die today, and stand before God, and God were to ask you, why should I allow you to come into my heaven, what would you say? And they're going to give you some works. You can ask them, are you a good person? Jesus said there is none good but one, and that is God. So unless they're God, they're not good. 